Good morning and welcome everyone to the 23rd meeting of the Local Government Communities Committee in, in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. We've got one apology this morning, unfortunately our Deputy Convener Monica Lennon can't make it so she passes on her apologies and we move to agenda item one which is decision on taking business in private. At agenda item one the committee is invited to consider whether to take consideration of its work programme at agenda item six in private. Are we agreed? Okay, thank you. We now move to agenda item two, uh, building regulations in fire safety in Scotland. And today the committee will take evidence on building regulations in fire safety in Scotland. And the session follows up on an inquiry into this issue carried out by our committee in 2017. And can I welcome quite a lot of witnesses this morning. Welcome Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning, and a member of the Ministerial Working Group on Building and fire safety and the ministers accompanied by Dr Stephen Garvin, Head of Building Standards and Jessica McPherson, Programme Manager, Building Standards Division, Scottish Government. Thank you for coming along. Uh, and may I also welcome Dame Judith Hackett, Chair of the UK Independent Review of Building Regulations and Fire Safety. And can I thank Dame Judith for taking the time to speak to me over the summer ahead of today's meeting. That, that was very welcome. Thank you for giving up your time. Uh, and can I also welcome Professor John Cole, CBE, Chair of the Building Standards Compliance and Enforcement Review Panel, uh, and Dr Paul Stollard, Chair of the Building Standards Fire Safety Review Panel. So lots of witnesses here this morning. Uh, we're going to hear a couple of opening statements before we, we, we go to questions. Uh, and I think the Minister is going to start us off and then Dean Judith. So, uh, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, convener, and thank you uh, to the committee for the invita invitation to attend today and the opportunity to update you on the progress of the Scottish Government's Ministerial Working Group on Building and Fire Safety. Um, we have made significant progress since I uh, appeared before you last September. Um, I'd like to thank the committee for your work on building standards. Uh, the report that you published in uh, October last year uh, clearly sets out and in many ways aligns with the broad range of issues uh, that the Scottish Government is seeking to address. Uh, and it has been uh, beneficial uh, to, to have uh, an oversight of your investigations as we progress. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dame Judith Hackett being part of this morning's panel. Uh, Dame Judith has undertaken a, a, an important review of the English building uh, standard system. And while the system in Scotland is very different, um, her work has highlighted key areas for improvement uh, where our interests are aligned, uh, such as skills and competence. And uh, we have kept a, a very close eye on Dame Judith's work. I'm also pleased to see Professor John Coe and Dr Paul Stollard, uh, the chair of, chairs of the review panels on enforcement and compliance of, and of fire safety and building standards. Uh, I'm very pleased to see them here today too. On the 13th of June, uh, they presented uh, the recommendations of their respective panels to the working group. Uh, these were accepted and on 4th of July, uh, we launched a 12-week public consultation on the proposals. After it closes, we will review the findings and move to implement uh, improvement measures. Uh, the third review of our work programme, the review of the fire regime and regulatory framework for high-rise domestic buildings, is ongoing and is expected to report its recommendations uh, to the working group by November. Uh, the Scottish Government confirmed on the 20th of June that it will initiate legislation within the current session of the Parliament uh, to require new build Scottish social housing to be fitted with automatic fire su suppression systems uh, following our decision to take over David Stewart's private members bill. Uh, this legislation will give full effect to it, uh, and I want to thank David Stewart for his campaigning and his stalwart work uh, in this area, and the government will continue to work with him. Uh, the Sprinkler Bill is in addition to our intention to bring forward regulations this autumn to extend the current high standard for fire and smoke, smoke alarms in private rented homes to all other homes. Additionally, um, establishing an inventory of high-rise residential buildings is nearing completion and once complete the Ministerial Working Group uh, will consider its ongoing maintenance and purpose. Uh, 
uh, as well as identifying appropriate action to improve the safety of buildings in Scotland, the group has continued to provide reassurance to residents and to the wider public. Uh, between October and December, uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service ran a targeted fire safety campaign for residents of high-rise buildings. Analysis of the feedback on the campaign showed that it had been successful in sharing information and in helping residents uh, to feel safer in their homes. I've provided a, a written update to the committee on the 6th of August uh, regarding fire door testing programme being taken forward by the UK Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government. Fire door performance came to light as a result of the police investigation into uh, the Grenfell Tower fire. As the testing programme progresses, the Scottish and UK governments remain in regular communication, with information being shared more widely where appropriate. However, the advice from both the Independent Expert Panel for Building Safety and the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service is that the, the risk to public safety remains low. I hope that uh, this brief update will reassure the committee that the Ministerial Working Group is maintaining priority and focus to improve the safety of buildings that people live in and use in their daily lives. And I'd be happy to take uh, any of your questions, convener. Okay, thank you, Minister. And Dame Judith? Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you very much for inviting me, first of all, to um, come to Edinburgh and talk to you about my report. Um, I would like just to be uh, clear about the scope of my work because I think it's important to understand that I was working from a, a somewhat different remit and a broader remit than, than the, the reviews of my two colleagues on, on my left, for whom I'm, to whom I'm very grateful for the um, support and input we had into our review, but recognising that, that, that they were slightly different. So... The scope of my review, as you are aware, was to look at fire safety and building regulations in relation to specifically high-rise buildings. Um, it was a remit that had both a time limit on it in that I was asked to produce the final report in less than a year from the outset. And also to do that in advance of the public inquiry into the Grenfell disaster itself. So I was working in that somewhat challenging space where uh, we were trying to make recommendations around how we could change the system without in any way compromising the process of uh, pursuing the detail of what actually happened in the disaster at Grenfell Tower. And I think that has led, as you will be aware, to some of the confusion around expectations as to what I was going to do and what I wasn't, and some of the... Um, specific areas of recommendations that people had hoped to see cover which didn't come out in my review because it was outside of scope. Having said all of that, we published the review in uh, May of this, of this year. Um, it has received uh, strong support from industry and from many of the stakeholders around industry, a real recognition uh, which came throughout the process to me where people were saying consistently this system is broken and needs to be changed. Uh, so we were able to, to uh, put forward our proposals for a major change to the way in which high-rise, higher-risk buildings are managed throughout their life cycle. And again, I think it's important to recognise that part of the challenge of the task that I had was not just to look at how do we build new and better, but also how do we address the issue of the many existing high-rise buildings that we have that may not be to the level that we want them to be and need them to be for the future for people to feel safe in their homes. So uh, you have seen the report. I know that uh, I was pleased to have access to a lot of information about what is happening here in Scotland. Uh, we had some very useful discussions. We also uh, had access to some meetings with stakeholders, which was particularly val valuable in helping us to see how residents within um, social housing here in, in Scotland are much better engaged in the process uh, than has been the case thus far uh, in uh, England, and uh, also 
to learn more about the way in which building control works here, and you will know that we have built some of those recommendations into our, our, our recommendations for the future for the, for the system in England, along with a number of others, not least of which is this golden thread safety case approach to high-rise buildings. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dame Judith. I know, I know there'll be lots of questions from fr from members. Um, just in relation to that golden thread that you, you spoke about, Dame Judith, we heard the minister talk about the, invent the, the inventory of, of, of high rises and, and the idea of having all the essential information that's needed to make sure you know what is on a building or how it's constructed at your fingertips could be part of that golden thread of information, I suppose. We had a slightly unfortunate or unedifying situation in Scotland where post Grenfell, when we were trying to ascertain what types of cladding were, were, were on high rises that we had um, individual uh, officers and local authorities going through antiquated files and bits of paper to see what was written down. And it was quite a time consuming an onerous uh, job, it has to be said. I mean, I think the Scottish Government, to be fair to them, offered additional support to local authorities that were, were struggling in, in the time constraints to, to do that. But uh, in terms of that, that golden thread of information, I'd be interested to know whether something similar has been suggested in England in terms of that, that inventory, and whether that should be a, a living inventory, what kind of things should be on it? Should new high... Uh, I'm rolling together a number of questions fairly small questions, but to get a flavour of what I'd be keen to know, you know, new builds should be on it. If, if significant adaptions take place, what should be on it? How can you have an effective inventory but go to the level of granular detail that we might need to, you know, have that golden thread? Because let's hope we never have a situation again where we have to interrogate um, what's actually on a building because there's been a disaster. But if we do, I certainly don't want that situation where local authorities are going through individual bits of paper trying to work out what's going on because that simply wasn't good enough. So that golden thread, but what's the take from England in relation to that, Dame Judith? I'd be really interested to know, uh, obviously, an update on where that inventory is in, in Scotland as well, Minister. Uh, Dame Judith. Um, there's work already going on looking at what should that pack of information contain. So, so uh, as... Uh, uh, my, my report did not go into that level of detail. We said that information pack needs to exist. Yes, it does need to exist for all new high-rise buildings. This is where the fact that I was looking at high-rise buildings comes sharply into focus, because we've said, first and foremost, our priority in England is to address this issue for high-rise, higher-risk buildings that are both new, about to be built, and those that are already existing. So yes, we do need to have that, uh, that golden thread which includes an information pack. I think what you've identified in terms of the fact that currently we have to go back into old files and bits of paper and so on is symptomatic of an industry that has failed to uh, keep up with uh, the state-of-the-art technology that is commonplace in the food industry, the automotive industry, and everything else that, w that is already in a state of having that information in digital form. And so part of what we are trying to drive in England is, is to get people not just to think about putting this together as, an, as a, a large file of paper, but to think about how this can be done digitally. Okay, thank you. Minister, do you want to add anything? Um, you asked specifically around about where we are with the inventory convener. Um, the data gathering for the inventory is being led by Capita uh, and is still underway, uh, but it's expected to be complete within the next few weeks. Uh, furthermore, uh, my officials are preparing an options paper uh, for consideration by the Ministerial Working Group um, at our next meeting on the 27th of September uh, and on how the inventory can be maintained and updated uh, going forward. Uh, the inventory itself uh, will give the, the current national picture of high-rise housing accommodation and it will be invaluable um, as a starting point, and I reiterate that, as a starting point uh, to understanding the makeup of our high-rise housing stock. 
Uh, discussion at the next meeting of the Ministerial Working Group will include uh, consideration of the purposes for which the inventory could be used, uh, the time and associated costs involved, and ownership accessibility, uh, including how new updates or amendments could be made. Uh, as well as that, um, there needs to be a focus on accuracy and the quality assurance of the data um, that is supplied. Um, this is not uh, an easy job, uh, but it is one that uh, we committed to do and needed to do. Um, but we must ensure, as you stated, convener, um, that it remains uh, a living uh, tool that can be updated uh, as we move forward. Um, so that's where we are at with the inventory. Um, as we uh, as we move forward, as per normal, um, I will continue to keep the committee updated on that. That's appreciated, Minister. I'm just wondering, Professor Cole or Dr Stollard, if there are certain key elements that you believe are absolutely no-brainers and fundamental to be to being included in, in that inventory that you'd like to put on on, on record just now. Um, one of the problems, as has just been described, that we find on the Edinburgh Schools Inquiry and on the uh, GG1 Inquiry were that there were totally inaccurate records of what had been built. Um, and it was very, very difficult and much more expensive actually to carry out the work because of the absence of that uh, information. It will also reflect the fact that significant design changes had happened during the construction process, which had not been controlled by the original designers of the project. Um, so the golden thread was already broken before you even got the building finished. And it meant that the people who had the building and operating that building didn't have the information they needed to properly operate uh, that building. Part of the recommendations that I've made in the compliance aspect uh, relate to the need to have a standardised uh, protocol for the collection and um, delivery of information in advance of a project to building control and or building regulations here. And after the uh, completion of the building, that they have to submit fully documented and certified as built drawings and specifications to show what has been built, marking up all divergences from the original approved warrants. That isn't happening at the moment because the process is too complicated and people don't slow up and people want to get away from a building quickly. The, the, the whole concept of actually recording what has been built and then what happens during the life of that building are fundamental to the safety of it. So I think we need to have a standardised protocol template format in a digital record which is available to building control. The thing about that is that will also help if it's recorded during the construction of the building to demonstrate that, that aspects of the construction have been built compliant with what was in the original design. So it's not just uh, um, a record, it's actually an indication of compliance to the process because we just don't have enough people out inspecting buildings to check that they are actually being built to the quality required. Okay, now, Dr Stollard, I might just explore that a little bit further and come back to you if, if that's okay. So, so my, my, my apologies in relation to that. You're quite right, Professor Cole, we could have the best system in the world, but we rely on the faith that what is actually documented is accurate and up to date and reflects what's actually been built. Um, you don't seem to have faith that that particularly happens at, at, at present because of the desire to get off site and uh, you know, basically get payment for the for the for the it, contract. It's an extra piece of work, and uh, uh, the procurement process complicates it slightly. If I just could digress slightly on this, um, in that if the original designers. In generally in design and build are not necessarily deeply involved in the inspection of the construction process, largely because contractors don't want to pay them extra fees for coming on site to find fault with the work that the contractor has done because the contractor is now the employer of the design team rather than the client, which I, I feel is, is a problem. Because of that, um, those designers don't actually know what has happened on site quite often. And because so much design is done by subcontractors who come on late in the process, in value engineering processes, etc., whereby there's changes made, the design team themselves, who produced the original drawings, 
quite often are unwilling to say, well, we can actually certify that this is what was built because we weren't there, we weren't on site frequently enough to confirm that, and we weren't advised of all changes in a structured and appropriate way. So what we're actually finding is that the information at the end of a project is what is, isn't being recorded by anyone to any great degree, and to do so costs money. So again, the quality aspects of how we manage our buildings are the things that have suffered in all of this squeezing at the lowest cost or maximum profit. And uh, as a result, um, nobody is really uh, aware as to what has actually been built in many cases. We had great difficulty in both in the, uh, in the schools issue and in the Dumfries issue of actually getting accurate details which reflected what we could actually see on site. And we could actually see that what was been built did not reflect what had been passed by building control and subsequently was the subject of a completion certificate. So there is that um, lack of continuity and a break in the golden thread, which means that nobody really knows uh, whether it's been compl it's compliant or not. And we find huge cases of non-compliance in all of those examples. So it would appear, Professor Cole, that whose responsibility it is appears a bit murky at well, best, if there's no real responsibility of an individual or of a company, then how can there be a sanction even after the event? So how can we address some of that? Well, the contract is a, is a basic way which defines responsibility. And the contract does say contractors will complete accurate as built drawings and hand them over to a client. But the client isn't in a position to check whether that process is being done in a thorough and conscientious fashion. And because generally they don't have people watching what the contractor is doing. Um, so the contractor is responsible in most cases for, for, for making those amendments, but he's going to have to pay designers or others to amend drawings. And if that's an expensive item and if they're unwilling to do it. And in the evidence given to our inquiries, we find that um, many architects and many engineers said, well, we were unhappy to actually complete a certification to say these are as built because we weren't there when it was built and we're not able to to say it was built that way and as we know it wasn't built that way and unfortunately in those instances to, 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 to a large degree. The client ultimately is a person who should carry the responsibility for delivering the building. He owns the building and we have to make that the responsibility but we have to have sufficient checks and balances in the system to ensure that that is happening. Yeah. So one of our requirements, which isn't a requirement now, is a building control get a full set of documented and certified as accurate by the contractor and by the, an independent design team members, what I've recommended, to say that this has actually been built in this way and is compliant with the regulations. And then building inspectors can go out and ensure that that is actually what has happened by checking that that has happened. But the number of visits carried out by building inspectors is totally insufficient and will never be sufficient to allow them to be reliant on that solely. We have to put more focus and more responsibility onto the client for buildings and onto the designers for buildings and onto the contractors for buildings and make sure that's integrated in a fashion which gives you a set of documentation which can be relied upon for the completion of the building to make sure that it's been built properly and for the future operational uh, use of that building through its lifetime. Physical, there clearly has to be a degree of trust because even with a thousand additional uh, inspectors out on building sites across the country, you're not always going to have a second pair of eyes for every, every piece of work that's done on a site. That's just not practical, nor would it be required. So I get that it's risk-based, but it seems just far too light touch at the moment. And the liability, you would suggest, sits with whoever has commissioned the, the school or the high rise, so it can sit with the local authority or, or the housing association, but the, the, the poor workmanship would be with the contractor or the developer. So it's getting that liability and that responsibility and that accountability over to the boots on site that are actually building and delivering the product. Any take-home messages on how we do that before well, I let Mr Simpson in for, to pursue this line of questioning further? A very simple one is a restoration of the clock of works. When I started as a young architect, we had clock of works on every site who were there on a continuous basis once it was a major job, and they were walking around constantly checking the work of all the people on site. And the architect and everyone else relied upon that information so they could sign certificates to confirm that it was compliant. Still doing their higher level check, and then building control would be a higher level check again. But that hands-on check, which unfortunately has to happen um, because despite the um, so-called quality assurance systems that all contractors now you know, sell when they go and give you a job and say we're fully qualified, quality assured, those quality assurance systems we saw files signed in and 
TICTAs haven't been fully compliant and we go on site and see that that hasn't been the case. Many of these forms are actually filled out in offices yeah. where people never even go out on site uh, and look at it. We need an independent scrutiny of contractors. What we've done is rely to self-regulation, self-certification by contractors far, far too much. And local authorities have lost the skills that they used to have. Many of them don't employ Clark Works anymore. They don't have, have that resource to get out and site. That needs to be built, and to do that, we have to actually develop courses again to, re to encourage people to take that up as a profession and a career, uh, because it has largely died out. Another example is the resident engineer. When I started as a young architect, and that's many years ago, um, we had resident engineers on site checking that the structural aspects of the building were being built, the reinforcement was getting the right size, the right place, etc. Um, I, I, I interviewed numerous uh, consultants who said we have never been asked for a resident architect engineer for to go on a job now for the last 10 15 years because that's another cut on the fees to cut the co the cost of the project and what we're doing is we're sacrificing quality um, in the, uh, for short term cost gain but if you look at the ultimate cost of that over the life of the building it's immense that's very helpful, Professor Cole. Um, the reason I was trying to restrain, restrain myself from making suggestions is that I know, know Mr Simpson will want to pursue some, some of this further. It's worth putting on record that our committee's uh, ra ra rather short inquiry in relation to this. One of the, the take-home messages we made was that there should be more Clark of Works more consistently on-site, doing more robust inspections. And we were, we were contrasting that, if you like, between I feel like a lot of the on-site work that takes place, which is basically warranty providers on site doing key stage checks which is a different beast in relation to protecting the developer from future claims than it is about the overall quality of of the build and protecting the client and the clerk of was certainly one of the things we said but I, I know Mr Simpson will want to come in and explore this a little bit further. Thanks convener. Um, uh, unfortunately um, n none of what you've, any of you have said is news, news to us. Um, because we, uh, as you know, we did our, our own inquiry. Um, it didn't just focus on public buildings and high rises. Um, the way we started was actually looking at, um, at dom domestic buildings, not high rises, ha normal houses, um, and issues people had had uh, with those new new built houses. Um, but it showed up exactly the same problems that you've described. That. I would go as far as to say the system is broken. Um, I don't think that's too too, too strong. Um, there are certainly failings in the system. Um, uh, Professor Cole, you've 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 outlined them uh, in Scotland. It's too easy uh, to build anything uh, and just uh, issue a completion certificate, um, and all that is is a certificate to say the building is complete. Um, it doesn't uh, prove anything. It doesn't prove quality. It doesn't prove standard. Um, you, 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 you've said it all, Professor Cole. Um, now, we made a, a series of uh, recommendations um, which were designed to improve that system, um, designed to protect uh, people who are buying properties. One of those was uh, Clark of Works. I, 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 didn't, I, I may have missed it in, in your recommendations. You'll, you'll correct me, Professor Cole, but I didn't, didn't see it there. I think that's an important thing, um, and uh, I think um, Dame Judith, you you um, said something which I think may be similar. You you can perhaps uh, tell us this. You um, call for a, a duty holder, and I wonder if that's the same sort of thing. There is no doubt in my mind at all that I agree with all that's been said. We have to make. Uh, responsibility at every stage of uh, a building's life cycle clear and explicit. Someone has to be that responsible person. Um, that responsibility as the duty holder can be delegated to someone like a clerk of works and in many cases in my view should be. I'm very much a supporter of, of the reinstatement of, of that sort of role in complex building projects. But re putting back in place some explicit responsibilities, but at the same time also making the penalties for failing to do these things serious enough that people will s accept and deliver on those responsibilities. Part of the problem we have with the system at the moment is that even if you do get caught, and we all know that the risk of getting caught is low, 
But even if you do, the penalties are risible. And it makes it worth taking the risk. We have to change the balance of that argument and make it not worth taking the chance for those who would otherwise do so. So this requires whole system change in many different aspects. Uh, and if I could just come, come back to you um, on that. The, 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 the recent review of the compliance aspect, um, I didn't particularly mention Clark Works in that exercise because this was looking at it from the compliance and enforcement of billing regulations perspective. What I've said is that the client must employ sufficient independent yes. scrutiny to ensure that he can deliver the evidence to building control officers that they can then rely on it to a sufficient degree, still checking it uh, with the right level of checking. That would be a, a series of combinations of different processes, including independent experts, resident engineers, clerk of works, architects, structural engineers, and how those resources are, 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 are managed. In relation to the Edinburgh uh, Public Inquiry, Edinburgh Schools Inquiry, and the Dumfries Inquiry, the, f the first reference uh, in each of those was the restoration of the clerk of works. So in, in terms of what the industry does and what clients do, the recommendation is very much uh, what you've said, and I think the clerk of works is a fundamental element that, independent from the contractor, somebody checking at a level of sufficient granularity that they can actually see what's been built is to the quality. Clerk of works and other names uh, associated with that in terms of the process used, it doesn't have to be a clerk of works. You know, there's a whole range of different people who, who can do that activity, but it needs to be done at the level of scrutiny that allows somebody to have the assurance. So those were the two recommendations. And just to be fair to the government, um, I think uh, an indication went out very shortly after the Edinburgh uh, Schools report requiring all public sector authorities to look at the independent use of uh, scrutiny on site and particularly the employment of clerk of works. And I believe changes have already happened significantly in that regard um, uh, among public authorities. But what, a, what, what about, um, you know, if it's not a public building that's been built, it's a private building, you know, it could be yeah. in a state of houses. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that, that I suppose, um, well, first of all, the recommendations in the Edmund report were not solely for the public sector. It referred to the industry as a whole. Okay. And we asked industry to make these changes and we asked clients to make these changes. Um, the best practice is to use a clock of works for those sort of projects which require that, that, that hands-on uh, um, involvement of, of inspection. Um, in relation to housing, there, there are the National House Building um, Council do have actually quite rigorous systems in place. Um, now, whether they're strong enough is something you really need to look at. Um, uh, but the uh, it's, all, it's all voluntary, Professor Cole. Well, I, I'm not sure. It, sorry, it is voluntary. Yeah, yes, it is voluntary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It needs to be tougher. Yeah, it shouldn't be voluntary. You know, yeah, I, builders should be required to do certain things that they're not doing. Yeah, but right that's now. the builder. The builder should build. There's no, there's no question. The builder is responsible for building to the standard, the specified. He's required to comply with the building regulations. It's, uh, it's, uh, that's a fundamental requirement. The problem is who's checking that he is doing it. And Absolutely. the checking has to be outside the builder, yeah. so it's not yeah. the builder. Yeah. And it's this independence of scrutiny. And I think that has to apply to any good client. You know, for example, if you get your house painted, before you paint the guy at the end, you go out and walk around to make sure that he's he's done behind the gutters or wherever you know wherever it is you ask him to. So you always check before you pay. I've, unfortunately, we've got the position where an awful lot of the building industry work is not checked by those who are paying it, whether they be public sector or private yeah. sector. So that's what that's what's missing. That's yes. the missing ingredient. It is. And and really, that comes down to you, Minister, to put something in place. Well, um, we are very grateful to Professor Coe and uh, his recommendations, and I think that the compliance plan approach that has been put forward um, is uh, the way that we should uh, pursue this. Um, I do think uh, that, uh, as has been highlighted by Professor Coe and uh, the Edinburgh Schools Report and DG1, um, that you know um, the emphasis often was not on the things that were actually 
the substantive uh, thing with that building. Um, if I remember <laughs> rightly, in the Edinburgh Schools report, uh, Professor Cole said that there was more emphasis on drains than there were anything else in that regard, and we've got uh, to change that around. Um, is Professor Cole rightly um, highlighted um, in his report, 80% um, of building warrants are um, for low value uh, and non-complex building work. 20% of that much more complex um, in terms of design and construction. And we need to put uh, an emphasis on all of that. Um, in terms of what the committee has said about Clarks of Works, for example, um, I've said exactly the same thing. You know, those local authorities um, that were using Clarks of Works on site um, were, find themselves in a, a much better position uh, in terms of what they were delivering. Um, what I am seeing as I go around the country in terms of the housing programme is that uh, those uh, housing associations, uh, uh, local authorities that put Clark Works at the forefront of what they're doing, um, they're building um, uh, quality um, and uh, uh, buildings that are uh, going to require a lot less maintenance in the future. And uh, a discussion that we had before we came in here uh, was that the clerks of works in certain places are also the folks who are responsible for the future maintenance of properties. Now, they are going to do everything possible that they can uh, to make sure that that building is top-notch so that they don't have to go back and fix it, uh, whatever part it is, in a, a few years' time. Um, I think that in terms of um, the, the industry itself across the board, whether that be public or private, um, we need to rethink, uh, go back to some of the old ways of doing things, as some folk would see them, uh, and bring back those folks um, who uh, were there on a regular basis expect, inspecting um, as they went along. Um, I'm sure that uh, Professor Cole wouldn't forgive me um, if I didn't add to that by saying, you know, we have a job of work to do um, in terms of training up um, people uh, to, to garner some of those skills um, that have been lost. I think there's an onus in all of us, uh, whether we be in government, local government, or industry itself, um, to, to look back, see what worked, uh, and reinstigate that. But there will never be any argument from me uh, around about bringing back Clarks of Works. Can, 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 I, can I just check for... I don't, is it specific? I just wanted to just double check something from the minister. I don't want to kind of take up with your line of questioning. It was just to get clarity around that, minister. Apologies, uh, Mr. Simpson, for this. So, is the Scottish government therefore keeping alive, actively considering having the power or the insistence for local authorities when they give planning approval to certain developments of a certain risk of a certain scale for insisting to have that independent, skilled, professional? individual on site to do the work of a clerk of works or similar could that be made mandatory and guidance before you get your building warrants or approvals is that something the scottish government is looking at in partnership with cosla because they're all the independent verifiers at the moment uh, in, in relation to that is that work that's ongoing um convener i don't think and i, I would have to check this out i don't think it's necessarily that something that could be done through um, the planning system per se. But in terms of uh, where we are and how we move forward on all of this, um, I will continue to emphasise, um, we're looking, uh, emphasise that this is the way forward. We're looking across government at this moment in time uh, and in terms of procurement as well, how we lay out um, procurement policy for the future. I would certainly... Uh, be encouraging of local authorities and others to have Clark of Works. I would have to get back to you, because I'm not sure off the top of my head whether that could be done through the planning system. Certainly we're looking at these issues through the procurement system, um, but I will get back to you in more depth around about what could or couldn't be done in that regard, I, Convener. I appreciate that. Could I ask a much more straightforward question in a different way? 
is the Scottish Government giving live consideration to bringing back a clerk of works or equivalent for large scale and complex projects on a mandatory basis, irrespective of what the legislative or delivery mechanism of that would be? As I say, we're looking at what we're doing uh, in terms of procurement convener. Um, I think that it would be the wise move to look at the procurement situation to have clerk of works back in, but we'll get back to you on that front. In terms of planning, off the top of my head, convener, I don't think it could be done through planning, but I will get back to you in the specifics. Thanks, Mr. Gina. I'm really sorry for, for just which wanted a bit of clarity on that when you go. No, quite, quite right, convener. Um, I, I just want to ask um, about one, one other thing um, for now, which was um, uh, uh, some of our recommended, a couple of our recommendations were about protecting people once they've bought a property and things go wrong, which, as you know, they do go wrong. So we had a couple of recommendations there. One was to introduce standardised uh, missives, and, and for Dame uh, Judith's uh, uh, benefit, uh, that is the contract that you sign when you buy a property in Scotland. So standardised missives, which we could build in uh, protections. Um, and, and, and when I asked the Law Society of Scotland about that uh, at this committee, they said, yes, that would be a very good idea. Uh, when I asked them what was required to bring that in, they said a change in the law. Um, in in uh, your response to us, uh, Minister, you said it was down to the Law Society. It appears to be down to a change in the law. So we need to change the law to bring that in. The other recommendation we had was to introduce um, a, a, a Homes Ombudsman uh, to, to protect uh, people. Now, I know this has been looked at um, down south uh, but that would apply only down south. We need a separate thing here. So I just wonder what your thoughts are on both those things. I haven't forgotten about you, Dr. Stollard. I apologise that the conversation has moved on. We'll be absolutely coming back to, to your area of expertise. You're welcome to comment on this just now or let some of your colleagues come in. Thank you. Who'd like to go first on that? Professor Cole. Um, on the issue of a home ombudsman, is that a question? Um, I, I, it's something actually I haven't looked into in any, any great depth. Um, it certainly sounds like something which would be a positive um, indication. I think you're thinking about that in England. Um, we certainly are. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what was clear to me as part of my review is, is that we are, we in England are further back than you are here in Scotland, I think, in this respect. Certainly, uh, what I found here was that people living in multiple occupancy um, buildings that are uh, local authority owned, uh, social housing, have uh, a, a much better route for raising concerns. But when the properties are owned and it is in the private sector, I don't think things are, are, are as far advanced. What we all need is to ensure that people who do have genuine concerns have a clear and effective route for them to raise those concerns and get a response. Minister, I don't know if you want to comment on those suggestions. Um, in terms of uh, all of these suggestions, I will continue to consider what is the best way forward. Um, I don't have anything at hand uh, around about the missives. Um, I'll look at what the Law Society has uh, said on this issue. Um, I don't know if that was um, in response to, ev uh, to, to the committee or whether that was evidence given. Um, but I'll look at what they have to say and I'll get back to the committee on uh, 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 around about my consideration of that. Okay, well, maybe move on at that point. Uh, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much, convener, and thanks for coming along. And um, obviously, thanks to you three in particular for the, 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 the work you've done. I think it's been extremely uh, useful. I've got a few specific questions, but, but to begin with, with a sort of rather general question. Um, uh, Dame Judith, you said that in England the system's not fit for purpose. It's broke. Um, in Scotland, the system is, is not broke, but it needs attention. So I'm just wondering if you can give us some sense of the kind of magnitude and time scale of fixing it in both jurisdictions in broad in broad terms, and whether we're and to what extent we're talking about legislative, fiscal, cultural standards and practice kinds of changes. I mean, it sounds like the, the challenge is obviously greatest in England. But if you give us some sense, um, I mean, I know the Minister's consulting on all this, so I wouldn't expect the Minister perhaps to have um, 
fully formed thoughts on this uh, at the moment quite appropriately, but from the point of view of the chairs, I'd be interested to some sense of the kind of magnitude and time scale you think we need to, to fix this. Can I break it into two parts? Because I think we've had parallel reviews, which is quite important. On the terms of the format of the regulations we have and the standards we set for buildings, the review panel concluded that it was essentially working. And the principle we have of functional standards supported by guidance needs to be improved, and we've got some recommendations about how that can be done. But fundamentally, that's a sound system. And that system relies, in fact, on the fact that the verifiers in Scotland are quite tightly controlled and are regulated to an extent because they're just done by the local authorities. Although we do come on, make a suggestion about a, a national hub for complex buildings. So in that sense, that can be fixed, I think, relatively quickly. And there could be amendments to the, um, to the guidance documents, certainly within a fairly short time, talking about six months, tw 12 months maximum. The only slight caveat on that is, as Dame Judith herself said, we're working slightly in advance of the Grenfell inquiry. So although we had a lot of crossover, and two members of my panel are, in fact, expert witnesses to the Grenfell inquiry, I'd just like to be conscious that we keep a record and check of what's going on there. I think we, we know 99% of what happened at Grenfell, but we don't know the final bits. So the little bit. But on the technical side, on the regulations, six to 12 months. Um, I think the, the issue is both cultural and practice. I think the regulations, as they set, and the system, as they set, will cover an awful lot of what we need to do. But it's what has happened over years. Um, I've been advised, and I, I'm, I never saw the final numbers on this, but that the number of building inspectors has dramatically reduced over the last number of years. Um, and yet the demand for them has probably increased with the increasing technology of buildings. Um, the number of visits carried out to sites are very, very few. And as the Minister mentioned, <coughs> we find there was a preponderance of visits looking at issues like drainage were joined into the, the local um, authority system. And rarely were, uh, was there much time spent. For example, um, I think one really difficult example was I think there were 31 visits to site, 29 were to do with visits and, uh, to the drainage, and two were looking at the building after completion. So during that whole stage when all the hidden work was being done, where a lot of the faults were hidden away, nobody was really visiting the site for those purposes. Now, I think that's to do with habit and practice. And what I've said this comment actually many times, that nobody ever was injured by a set of drawings falling on them. So we, we may, well, they might have been, but um, not to my knowledge. Um, but what we're doing is we're spending huge resources making sure that the drawings are absolutely correct. But nobody is actually then going to see that the building, which is the whole purpose behind it, is actually built according to those drawings. So the focus of what we're doing is about building safe buildings, not about producing safe drawings. And yet that's where the huge amount of effort is going into offices and building regulations departments all around the land. The focus hasn't been sufficiently on making sure that what is built, we need to turn it around. We need to say that that is a compliant building, not a compliant set of drawings, because the connection between the two disappears as soon as those drawings go out of the office onto, on, onto site. So there's an issue about capacity, about capability within the building uh, uh, um, inspectors' teams and local authorities, the difficulty to recruit them, the, the fact that there are no longer training programs for building inspectors at any of the universities, and I know there's some work underway which is to be encouraged by labs and others to try and develop such courses at, at local universities, but we're not training them, we're not recruiting them. The age profile of those people is getting older. The level of skill required to recruit them has dropped because you can't, uh, the, the salaries don't make it attractive enough to attract young people. The further you're away from the central belt, the more difficult it is to recruit those people. So there's a, there's a problem in terms of how we apply the system. The rules are all probably there, the capacity to extend what we ask for in terms of information and, and requirements from contractors is there, but we don't apply it in sufficient rigour. So while the system isn't broken, the application of the system is insufficient. Do you want to add something to that? Um, yeah. I think um, one of the main reasons why um, our system uh, is better than that south of the border is because of the flexibility um, that was put into legislation here to allow for changes quite quickly. 
Um, and I think that is important to, to point out. Uh, and that's why, you know, as uh, Dr. Stollard has said, some of the changes that um, we will make um, can be done quite quickly compared to um, some of the change that will be required um, south of the border where primary legislation um, will be required. So I, I think, you know, we, we built in in the past a level of flexibility which has allowed us uh, to update and maintain um, standards and that uh, is why we are in that better position. But, you know, we will not be um, complacent uh, around about that. Uh, you, you know, a lot of this harks back to compliance issues. I think this is one of the key findings um, from uh, uh, Professor Cole's um, recommendations, and that's something you know that I take very seriously, that Ministerial Working Group takes seriously, and that um, I think is one of the areas where we need to move forward. Uh, culture and skills is the other things that Mr. Whiteman mentioned. Um, I do think that there needs to be cultural change um, across the board, and we are going to have to. Uh, ensure um, the industry itself recognises uh, that it needs to change. Um, I think, again, in a discussion that we had outside, um, you know, where all of us have come into contact with industry on uh, numerous occasions of late, um, people um, are in agreement um, that, you know, things need to change. But when you ask the question, about what are you going to do, that's where you hit a wee bit of a stumbling block. Uh, and that is one of the things that we need to, to get over. Um, and of course, um, the compliance um, regime, um, as envisaged by um, Professor Cole, will push folk into that position of having to change culture anyway if we adopt all of that, which I think um, we are uh, likely to do. Um, so that in itself will help us uh, in some regards with culture. The skill set scenario, um, whether that be in building standards or within the industry um, itself, um, I certainly recognise um, that we need to um, uh, create a, a situation where we're attracting folk to building standards in local authorities. That's one of the reasons why um, I agreed to raise fees recently so that local authorities had the ability to invest in building standards. Um, as Professor Cole has, uh, has said, um, we're working closely with uh, labs to see what can be done, um, not only in terms of uh, ensuring that we have the right courses, but trying to uh, get the right people uh, to join an industry which uh, shall we say, the demographic it is uh, quite high. Um, so we do have the challenge uh, of ensuring that we have the right folks. Um, I think that we are up for that challenge. I think labs have been extremely supportive in terms of um, uh, what they, uh, they have been doing to help us in that regard. Uh, and we need to, to move forward together. Uh, to make sure that uh, building standards is seen as being an at attractive um, career for the future. Dave Judas. Um, one of the most striking differences that I encountered in, early on in my review uh, between uh, the systems uh, south of the border and, and here in Scotland was the very fact that you're not allowed to break ground on a building up here until you have demonstrated and put in front of building control <coughs> a design for what you're going to build. That is different from what we have currently in England. And I think that's a powerful and very effective gateway in the process. And in the discussions that I had with people subsequent to that, what became apparent was that when you put a simple gateway like that in process, lots, lots of other things change as a result of that. And what changes is that because that exists, people put more effort up front into getting the design right so that they can get through that gateway easily rather than coming with some um, sketchy design that then has to be um, filled out during the course of the construction process. So that's a, a really powerful um, gateway in the process. That's the basis on which I have proposed 
that the system in England needs to now not just have that gateway in, pl in place, but a similar gateway at the completion stage. So that rather than talking about sending people out to look and see whether people have complied, the onus shifts. It goes back to what Professor Cole was saying earlier, that the onus is with the client to come to the regulator and say, I can demonstrate to you that I have built a building that is in compliance and I now need you to give me permission for that building to be occupied. Okay, thank you. Do you want to follow up on that, Mr Reitman? Yes, please. Uh, thanks very much. That's extremely useful. Um, I've got a few sort of quick questions, I hope. Time, time is pressing. I know other members want to, to speak. But I was very struck by this, um, uh, th this flowchart you produce in your report, Dame, Dame Judith. And I was just wondering briefly, from a Scottish point of view, this is broadly the same? I mean, there might be a few details, but it's broadly the same, or, or, or is it very different? Can I respond to that, Chair? I think it is quite different. Okay. Because we have different origins of the systems and totally different ways. And as, as Dame Judith has said, we have a very strict rule of you don't start on the site until you've got your warrant. And we have another strict rule in law, but it may not be properly being enforced, which you don't occupy a building until your completion certificate has been accepted by the verifier. Yep. And there is an issue which John explores very carefully in his report about the problems of temporary occupation certificates, which sometimes get around that. So I'd actually suggest that the flowchart in Scotland is really quite measurably different. Mm -hmm. uh, it does have some degree of complexity, yes, but we also have a separate Fire Scotland Act, mm -hmm. which means the relationship of the fire and rescue service into the system is different in Scotland from in England. And we don't have a private sector of approved verifiers in Scotland, which, coming from this system, that seems to complicate the English system enormously, because okay. we only have the 32 verifiers at the moment. So I think there's a significant difference. Okay, that's very helpful. Thanks very much. Uh, I mean, it strikes me, reading the reports you've produced, that a lot of this is about culture and it's about how we've changed the way we do buildings. So Professor Cole, you talked about historically a university would want to build a building, employ an architect, they engaged a contractor, competitive tenders, a clerk of works would be accountable to the client, seeking the client's interest. And yet now we have, for example, a lot of speculative building. I mean, in your introduction, Dame Judith, you talk about the primary motivation is to do things as quickly and cheaply as possible. Um, so for example, the high school that my daughter went to has got a 40 year design life. She came from a primary school that is 125 years old and will last for another 125 years. So it seems to me that some of the cultural issues are not just about how we do things, but it's in the actual commissioning, how long this thing is designed to, live, to, to last for, and also, is the client actually going to be around after occupation, which on a speculative build, they're not going to be, with a university or a hospital board or a local authority, obviously they are going to be around and therefore, etc. I was struck in Professor Cole's report by a paragraph 64 where you say it must be made clear that it is the legal responsibility of clients for all buildings that will be used, occupied, used, worked in or visited by members of the public to ensure that these buildings are compliant with the regulations. But yet in paragraph 24, you draw attention to the fact that the kind of design and build regime means that such appointments of design teams frequently contain confidentiality clauses whereby the professional design team are prevented from conveying concerns to the actual client for the project as to defective construction quality or changes from the approved design. So how can a client actually uphold their legal responsibilities when in fact things are being hidden from them? The way they do it is by employing <coughs> independent scrutiny, uh, either in the form of their own architect, representatives, employers, agents, clerk or works, etc. So if you go down the design and build rate, you're standing back and saying the contractor is now responsible for the design. And as, as you just said, in fact, I was at a meeting yesterday in London where this was discussed, the difference between somebody who's building a building and moving on to the next one and getting rid of that building immediately they're not really worried about the 20, 30, 40 year life of that building. They're worried about building it as cheaply as possible and they'll get the biggest profit when they sell it. And whereas the public sector client building a building should be thinking about the lifespan of that building, what it's going to contribute to the, the local uh, um, society uh, and, and community. Um, whereas if we pass it to a contractor and say, you design and build it, 
uh, then you're, you're standing back from that. So I, I don't think that we can delegate that responsibility. I think clients have to be intelligent customers. They have to know what they're building for, and they have to set down a strategy for a building for a lifetime. The first thing we should do, and in, 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 in before any before even an architect lifts up a pencil, is actually sit down and describe what are the objectives of the building. Buildings are means to an end, not ends in themselves. And yet quite often they're treated as ends in themselves, just like other commodities. They're not the things that are going to live and shape and, and affect society over centuries, as you say. You know, and, and when we look around and we, we treasure so many parts of the, of, of, the, of the built infrastructure around us that makes Edinburgh what, what Edinburgh is and other cities, what it is, and yet we're very casual in terms of how we actually prescribe what it is we're seeking to achieve in our buildings. We need stronger clients, we need clearer clients, we need more strategic clients, we need a long-term view of the future, and we need to procure our buildings in a way that protects that and ensures that those objectives we set at the start are actually being delivered both in relation to the function of the building, what it does to society as a whole, and what it, how it works in terms of the individual bits, in terms of safety and functionality. Can I, can I add just one thing? Um, going in there. Into the Scottish system it stands at the moment. The moment you buy a building, or take it over, or become the owner, you accept those obligations. And one of the problems, I think, which is lacking at the moment in the system is the awareness of clients when they take over a building, whether it's design and build, they're accepting those obligations. So there needs to be some sort of buyer beware. You talk about the misses before, the awareness that you are accepting that. So there, if there are faults, that is who society is going to act against, the owner. So there is that particular thing when the transfer from the design and build company to the operating company. And you will see it in some organisations and some commercial businesses, but in many there's a level of in ignorance that they are taking on those responsibilities. I think the problem is that the objectives are not necessarily aligned. And the issue that you raised about preventing the design team speaking to the real client, what I call the real client, the owner of the building, well, that the number of people came to us and said, we are signed a confidential agreement, we're not even allowed to go on site and check, have they changed the design, have they uh, downgraded the specification, and we're not allowed to tell that to the actual client. And that was the case, there was no, in Dumfries, for example, there was no discussion between the architects and designers of that building and the, the client. Everything was done through a contractor, and the contractor determined what that client, what that architect or designer would do, how often they'd come to the site, if they came to the site at all, and whether they did snagging or reviews or quality assurance during that process. But yet the clients naively think that once there's an architect involved, that somehow or other he's working from, for, the, for the wider good, whereas actually he's in a contract which is saying, this is what you will do and you'll only do this bit. We only want to get your design to win the job and get it through the next stage, but we don't want you to come and tell us how to build. We'll do that because we, we'll take shortcuts and we'll, we'll, we'll value engineer. Now, that's a word which we need to really redefine, value engineering. It is essentially cost-cutting and quite often quality-cutting. We need to look at value in, in the proper sense as to the long life of the building, what it offers to the people who are going to use it. And we, we have to align those objectives and get contractors and procurement uh, in a in, in the place where they're aiming in the same long-term direction for buildings as the rest of society are. At the moment, that is not necessarily the case, and part of government procurement has driven it that way. I've got a few other questions I'm conscious of time. We'll be back at the end. Yeah, uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. This morning we've identified, and your reports have identified, some very worrying indications when you talk about the system not being fit for purpose when you talk about the difficulties and the flaws and the checks and balances, that has to ensure that we cannot then guarantee uh, the safety, and safety may be compromised in some of these buildings, in some of these locations. That's a very worrying situation for you all to find in a professional capacity that you are having to deal with. Now, how can we ensure that that is not the case, that safety is not being compromised if we do not see the checks and balances, if we do not have the enforcement, if procurement is poor uh, and there is not the real enforcement that is required to give the confidence to visitors and people living in buildings that their safety is not being compromised. Dame Judith. I think it's fundamental that you do have that, that check and balance in the system. And that, that is, again, why one of my recommendations in my report is that for buildings above that risk threshold that we've set, 
uh, and I'll say a little bit more about why we set it where we did in a moment, for those buildings that, that sit above that threshold, uh, not only must they go through a gatekeeping review process during construction, but that needs to continue through the life cycle of the building, and that for existing buildings above that threshold, we will apply that regime retrospectively, and the new competent authority that we will set up, combining the skills of three different regulators, will actually conduct safety reviews of all of those buildings above the threshold. The threshold itself, at, uh, at, at the level that we set in the report, is, is based upon uh, taking those of highest risk, uh, as demonstrated by the evidence of where most fires and multiple fatalities have occurred, and doing that first, uh, and that sets a bar at somewhere in the region of three to 5,000 buildings that we'll have to look at retrospectively in England. But in my view, there is every reason to lower that threshold with time. And this goes back in part to the answer to your question of how quickly can we do this. If we try and do everything at once, we will never get there. We have to prioritize this. We have to go for those buildings that we have the most concern about first and then extend the regime once we have demonstrated its effectiveness. That's my view on how we have to do this. Well, just exactly uh, what Dame Judith said, um, we have no alternative but to have the enforcement, you know, to have people on site inspecting until we have confidence that the industry is delivering it right first time. And we need to change the culture of the industry. That is a long term process. That isn't going to happen overnight. That's going to take years to change the culture of the, of the industry. But in the meantime, when we cannot rely on them to do what has been asked of and what's been specified and what has been drawn, then we have to have independent scrutiny. And that means people have to invest in putting the right resources, clients have to invest in putting the right resources in, be that clerk of works, architects, independent uh, uh, consultants, who will do a proper check to ensure they're getting right. Now, this can be easily added, uh, helped by digital information, time and date recorded, certified information being required as a standard part of the building control process. And I don't think that that's something which uh, needs uh, extra legislation. I think that could be part of the process now. Um, I, I bow to others to, 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 to check that aspect about legislation. But I think by insisting on that information and, and ensuring that we look at the high risk issues, and you'll see in, in my recommendations that I've asked for a, a, a compliance uh, cert certificate of evidence uh, to be documented, identified in advance of the project by building control so that they can um, say in advance, we are going to require evidence of these various aspects of the building to be shown digitally recorded and certified by independent experts before we will accept the building. And those extra requirements are what we need to put in place. That means money. That means we have to put money back in that has been stripped out of the process. So we've actually stripped out a lot of the money which was there to protect quality in a, in a false economy, unfortunately. Okay, Dr Stollard, then Minister. I think we have in Scotland, through the Building Scotland Act and the Fire Scotland Act, two pieces of primary legislation which give us the, the groundwork that we need. And we can, through the procedural regulation under there, cover most of these issues in a relatively short time and significantly faster than I suspect England could do if they need primary legislation. In terms of the idea of taking off a group of buildings, that takes us back to where the Minister was starting at the beginning, with the inventory, where we are identifying those high-rise residential buildings. And because of the decisions taken back in 2005 as to what we permit as cladding on those buildings, the number which actually have particularly dangerous cladding, I don't want to go into technical details, is significantly lower because England and Wales did not choose at that time to adopt the same standard that we did for buildings with floors over 18 metres. And one of the recommendations of my own review panel was that we bring that down for the future from 18 metres to 11. So we have the process in place. The other thing to say on the inventory in particular is it's essential that that includes changes to those buildings. And the inventory is a live thing. It's no use if it is, as of today, it's only of value, and that requires an investment for the long term. Because the classic example in Grenfell, it wasn't that the building itself was a problem, it was the refurbishment of the building. Minister? Um, convener, um, just follow on very briefly from uh, Dr. Stollard. I, 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 I don't think we can emphasise enough 
the difference that the Act, the 2005 Act, made here compared to south of the border because it has allowed us uh, to move on uh, and to ensure um, that standards have continued to be improved upon. Um, and that is one of the reasons why uh, we have not got the same difficulties that have arisen south of the border um, with ACM because of the changes that were put in place uh, because of the Act. And again, as, uh, uh, as was pointed out to Mr Whiteman in answer to his question, uh, because we have that Act, we are still in a position where we can be flexible and make changes um, without um, too much bother, which primary legislation uh, often uh, uh, well, it takes a long time. Um, you know, there has to be a, a, a huge amount of uh, consultation. Um, so we are in a better position in that regard, without a doubt. Uh, I would like to go back to the point of the verifiers as well, because we do have the local authorities as verifiers here still, whereas south of the border, um, you know, there is a, a hodgepodge. Um, I know that the committee itself uh, uh, came under some pressure from uh, folks uh, to extend or to get, try and get me to extend verification to private bodies. Um, I have not done so. Uh, again, we're not complacent about um, the 32 local authorities, as the committee is well aware. Um, you know, there are three local authorities that I was not quite so happy with, um, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Stirling. Um, we're seeing uh, improvement um, in Glasgow. Um, we're seeing improvement in Edinburgh because we have put in a team of experts to help them on their way. Things are holding steady um, in Stirling, but you know I'm getting regular updates and will continue um, uh, to keep a close eye on these authorities. I think one of the things which has been recommended, which is extremely important as, as far as I'm concerned, is ensuring um, that we uh, have uh, a sharing of expertise, um, which sometimes uh, has not happened to the extent that we would all like. And beyond that, there is um, expertise which is maybe not available um, in certain uh, authorities. And I think that's why the central hub uh, that we're consulting on is a, a very, very important recommendation um, in terms of pooling of resources. Um, and, you know, that central hub itself uh, could not only verify design, but maybe play a part in looking um, at uh, construction uh, itself. Um, it was touched upon by you earlier on, convener, and others just now, uh, around about records and record keeping. Um, and some of the record keeping of, uh, in the past was largely... Um, in a, a, a paper format, as I think you pointed out, convener. We have moved on from that. We now have e-building standards. Uh, that allows us a degree of flexibility in moving forward uh, with some of the, uh, the uh, recommendations uh, that have been made. Um, so those are, I think, the, the, uh, the issues that we need to look at. That's the place where we're at. Um, while Mr Stewart uh, talks about risk um, and is right to do so, I think that we are in a much better place than they are south of the border. Uh, we are not being complacent about any of this. Um, the, uh, we'll, we'll look very closely at the consultation and the recommendations. I think the recommendations are, are uh, pretty, pretty good, uh, and we will move forward in that front. Um, and uh, convener, as per usual, um, as we move forward, we'll continue to keep the committee informed of where we're at. I'd be well, welcome, Minister uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you. I, I think you know you, you've, you've all answered the question, and, and the ministers hit the nub on the head that we find ourselves in a stronger position in Scotland because of the uh, the quality and the checks and balances that we do now have. But all of that, as you've all identified, comes at a cost, and the cost of maintaining and ensuring that that will continue uh, in a difficult situation uh, and you've identified minister a number of councils who are doing extremely well uh, and you've also identified a number that give you cause for concern uh, and those that are giving you cause for concern are now being addressed uh, but at the same time that still gives us the anxiety within some of these communities that some of the local authorities are not 
uh, giving the priority to this uh, other authorities see the need of giving that priority. And, and unless it is supported financially, unless it is given the right manner of business and attitude, then we will not succeed. Uh, and there may well be more required to do in some of these local authorities to ensure that they do comply and that they do progress and go forward. Because that, at the end of the day, is what's important here, uh, that we do have the, the, the checks and balances in place, but we also have the financial resources that can support and maintain that going forward. Sure. Ke Ke uh, sorry, I, I, yeah. I apologise, Minister. It's just that... That, that, I mean, that's an important question to ask. Of course, what I'm just sitting here as a member of the Scottish Parliament for Glasgow, Mary Hill and Springburn, with many, many, many high rises there, and many, many of my constituents and families staying there. The housing associations, which there are several, and the fire service have been absolutely proactive to go out of their way to give uh, communities and residents absolute confidence as much as they can uh, that where they are staying is safe and secure and looked after and, and well maintained and I just always like to put that on the record from time to time because I will absolutely terrier like uh, pursue to make sure there's absolute safety but what we don't want to do is worry families that by and large are staying in safe secure well maintained properties I'm sorry if that feels a little bit indulgent but I've got many 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 constituents and families staying in those properties and I think it's important to put that on the record. Minister, my apologies. Um, I, I think that it's right to put that on the record. Um, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, um, after the tragedy, tragedy at Grenfell, um, were immediately carrying out inspections to ensure um, that people uh, knew that they were safe uh, in their homes. Uh, and I pay tribute to the, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service um, for their efforts. Um, off the top of my head, uh, convener, um, uh, uh, there were hundreds of visits carried out. Um, I think it was over 800, if I remember rightly, 890 springs to mind, I'm getting nods there, um, which were carried out uh, by the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. That gave people confidence. Um, like yourself, convener, uh, I have a large amount of high-rise res residential buildings in, in my constituency. There are 59 in Aberdeen in total, the vast bulk of them within my constituency. Um, and I know that the, the meetings um, uh, uh, that took place also um, gave folks confidence uh, in the, the place that they, they lived. Um, going back to Mr Stewart's point uh, around about investment, you know, one of the reasons why I agreed to um, raise uh, building standards fees, which hadn't been raised for a number of years, uh, was to ensure um, uh, that the, uh, the income was there. Um, it's, uh, it's good to see uh, a number of local authorities um, in their budgets this year investing in planning and building standards, I would like to see many more of them doing so. Um, it may come to a point, convener, uh, where we have to look at whether um, there should be a, a ring fencing uh, of this. We, uh, as a government, really don't like um, ring fen fencing. I, as a councillor, never liked uh, ring fencing, but it is an area of business um, which has been left neglected by some uh, for uh, too long. I hope that we don't have to do that. I hope that there's a recognition by local authorities that they need to um, uh, invest in these areas. But, you know, there's always the possibility um, of taking those actions if others don't. Um, the um, scenario of, um, of providing additional support you know, we have said right along that um, my building standards officials will, uh, will help uh, in whatever way they can if an authority is not uh, performing well. Um, we've seen just after Grenfell uh, a number of authorities um, taking uh, that offer. Um, one did not, which was not very wise in my opinion. Um, Edinburgh um, have uh, got the, the expert team uh, in. Um, at this moment in time. I'm glad that they accepted that. Um, it may well be in future that we have to do um, similar things in other authorities. Uh, but in saying that, looking at um, uh, uh, figures that I've s seen the other day, 
um, in uh, 20 of the local authorities, um, uh, the uh, standards are, are, are rising. Um, there are others where um, they are, are uh, uh, they're on a par with what they were previously. Um, some, in terms of customer service, have gone down. Um, this is something that I feel is very important for me to keep looking at. Um, and as we move forward in terms of future um, decisions that I will make about verifiers, I will take all of this into account. But you can be assured that I'm not afraid um, to, to, to move others in to help uh, if that is what's required. And of course, the final thing is that I could remove the verification um, from a local authority, uh, verification powers from a local authority, and give it to another local authority to deal with if we, uh, if we find that things are not satisfactory. Okay. Thank you. A um, couple of questions at the end of the room. Mr Simpson wants back in, I suspect, on, on, on a similar line. Um, we've spoken a lot about the building standards and verification and the process. And of course, the, the, I suppose the, the media spotlight on Grenfell was the, the type of cladding that, that, that was used on, on, on the building. Um, one of the things that happens when you sit on this committee is you're sometimes approached by uh, different stakeholders in the field, sometimes commercial stakeholders, uh, very appropriately, I have to say, who will say to you, look, our insulation product is is the best. Here's here's a video of a test. And so I've got this a test to show you that this performs really well under lab conditions. And then an another company will show you a different insulation product and they'll show you their test and they'll tell you why theirs is the best under lab conditions. And then they'll question other lab conditions. The reason for the reason for getting to that level of detail is it does leave um, MSPs going well. How can we be assured that the testing regime in the lab is robust, appropriate, and replicates the actual real life situation once you put a product on a building? Because it's easy to artificially, under a controlled environment, produce a result that is safe. Maybe not easy, but you can do it, but then when you go and construct the, the cladding onto the side of a building or whatever, it's a very, very different experience. So if I have another MSP that have had similar experiences, had people contacting them saying, look at this, this shows that our product is the safest, it should be non-combustible or it should be limited combustible or whatever. How do we know there's a robustness in itself in relation to the lab tests on, on products as put together? Dr Stollard. You pose a very, very good question. Um, fire testing has a long history, going back to the Second World War. Um, in about 2000, we established, with other countries in the European Union, a series of European harmonised tests. Now, they are testing for specific purposes in specific contexts. And those tests, the review panel I'm doing, we are suggesting should now, from now on, be the only tests we use. We have run two sets in parallel since 2005, which are British standard tests or the European harmonised tests. But really having such a long runoff has been sufficient. We should now just go to European harmonised tests. Now, they cannot replicate the situation in every building, because every building is slightly different. So you're looking for certain characteristics of materials and extrapolating from that in a reasonable manner. Now, for that reason, we suggest there should be a degree of caution, and you choose, therefore, fairly um, high standards. Hence, we're suggesting in the review panel is recommending only A1 or A2, and not B, C, D, E. That is a conservative approach. Now, you cannot guarantee that in every situation, and you don't want to remove the flexibility occasionally. So they are also recommending that we should allow, allow a, a large-scale test, which involves building basically a three-storey section of the building and testing that on a large-scale rig. You can't guarantee any of this. You're looking at what is the best the industry can do and the best quality control. So you want to have test houses that are testing properly and are under a regime of checking. We have a building research establishment um, uh, 
down in England, which serves not only the UK, but wider than that. And the head of testing there, uh, Dr. Debbie Smith, was one of the members of my review panel giving advice there on how we should do this. So it isn't perfect, but it's the best we probably have, and we are being deliberately cautious in the standards we are setting to ensure that we have a margin of, of safety there. So is that under current standards or improved standards? That's under our current standards. What we're going to improve it by reducing the A1, A2 from floors over 18 metres down to over 11, and that's related to fire brigade uh, jet throws. And we're also extending it slightly in the number of building types to which that'll apply. And that's what we're consulting on at the moment. That is actually different from what the English approved document said. Okay, now again, just for clarity, does A1 or A2 include non-combustible, although should everything burns if you put it to high enough temperature, non-combustible and limited combustible products? In in England, they have used the terms non-combustible for A1 and limited combustibility for A2. The question is, those are, uh, are demarkers, but aren't terribly useful phrases, and they get taken by the media out of context. I'd prefer to use just A1 and A2, because then you have a scientific test which you can check against. So, as you say, it depends on exactly... You've got to have exactly the test furnace and the test fire. But basically, A1 and A2 are the two lowest categories. And I apologise for anyone trying to follow this. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it simple. <laughs> no, no, no and, and, and I understand it, but I'm actually, and I apologise that I'm having to get you to mirror back to what I think the understanding is, because right. it's not straightforward and written down in basic, obvious, common sense language anywhere is, is the issue. So I can ask a further question, and that is, if you pass your A1 or A2 test, does that get you your BR135 certificate? Oh. No, it's more complicated than that. Oh dear, I thought it might be. Okay. So that gives, that sets some certain extra conditions about how it's fixed and assembled and things like that, and okay. how the test is performed. I thought it was worth asking those questions because I think the underlying question is how are people supposed to have absolute confidence in a system that you can't just pick up and read and understand at first glance, which is something we really need. Dr Stoddard, I will let you back in, I promise, but Dame Judith was, was, was wanting to get in during, during that line of questioning. I, th Thank I think you, what's Dr. also Stoddard. important is that we must recognise the limitations of the test, because all that the test tells you is that if you use those materials and you install them properly and you do not substitute anything else at any time in the future for any of those elements, you will have a system that meets that standard. Part of the problem we know that exists is that you can start with the right materials and if you do not install them correctly on the building or the building is not suitable for those materials to be applied, then the assurance that is offered by the test becomes meaningless because other, other factors are, are, are compromising the, the performance of the materials and that is... I think really important for us all to understand that, that the test says if you install this right and all other things are equal, this will be okay. It is those other things we need to worry about being able to assure just as much as it is about the materials that you start with. That, that's helpful. That, that is absolutely where the, hopefully the next couple of questions will, will lead us to some of that information. Dr Stollard and then Professor Cole. Only to say... I am not at all suggesting to the committee that these tests are perfect. They are the best we have, they have a track record, and they are widely accepted in other jurisdictions. And therefore, we use the best we have. But Dame Judith is absolutely correct. You've got to use them in the way they're meant to be used and without trying to circumvent it. And we have had examples in Scotland of where there's been innocent substitution because contractors didn't realise that this product, which looks physically the same as this product, is not the same. And because it's on a shorter delivery time, they use it. So you've got to be absolutely sure that what you've specified is being put up there. Uh, Professor Cole? I, I just wanted to add an issue, coming back to the whole inspection issue, that a test condition, you'll have the thing fitted absolutely perfectly and installed perfectly with the fire stopping in exactly yeah. the right place. When you go on site and you're working with staff, because there's no requirement in terms of a, a trained fire stop 
<coughs> fire stopping installer. You know, those are labourers generally who come on site and do things after maybe a couple of hours training somewhere off site. Um, that's where the inspection bit comes in because no matter what you, installation materials you use and whether they're combustible or non-combustible, limited combustibility, if you've got chimneys of air flues through them, you know, letting air move up and create chimneys, um, that's, that's going to be a problem. Um, and what we find, unfortunately, in many of the examples I've done in the inquiries, were that the compartmentation between, uh, in, which is supposed to stop the spread of fire to protect life and to protect the buildings, was um, very, very badly done, if, if they're at all. So that's back to, unless you inspect what's been built, no matter what fire tests show and what they, you know, has unless been shown. Unless the installers are competent. Unless the installers are, are competent, unless it's followed to the detail. <coughs> And building on an 18 storey block or you know whatever height it is, you know, um, up in the wind and some guy climbing up and going off for lunch, you you know somebody has to be inspecting those things, and that's where the faults will really happen. That's where the bigger risk will be in the installation, maybe rather than necessarily in, in the specification of the material. I think that surely helps to tie together both ends of, of of that process. But there's a bit in the middle that I think Dame Judith was was alluding to, which is so you have your product tested under fitted as beautifully as it possibly can be, as competent as it can be by professionals under lab conditions, and then you go there to the real world uh, and, and it's making sure that that's done competently. But the bit in the middle, and, and the point that's put to me, is is you change a widget on 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 your on your product, so you've got the same insulation, but you vary slightly the panels or a bit of material that's used, and it dramatically can change how it perform under under conditions, but it's still having that same certificate signed off somewhere down the line to see that it's compliant. So it's about the traceability of the overall product that eventually goes on to the building to make sure that it's uh, competent and appropriate. And my understanding is that the desktop exercises take place where a relevant individual will look at the variation and sign it off as being appropriate without particularly knowing whether it is or isn't. Would, would that, could that, Dr Stollard first, but could that be the situation? Come back, come back. Because the A1, A2 are basically dealing with materials, it's more about what the material is and how the panel is assembled, rather than how the, com the assembly of components on site goes. So it's harder to um, misuse that. Um, if you're doing the full rig test, then it's harder then obviously you, you're concerned about how the different layers, layers assemble. So it's, there is a little bit of comfort I can offer you on the A1, A2 because the product will be to that standard. You're quite right that, uh, and as John and Dame Judith have said, you need to have it built as it was intended to be built. Um, but the product itself is, is fairly sound on A1 or A2. The difficulty is when you put in other products around it that aren't. So the A1 or A2 has to apply not only to the one product, but to certain other products as well that are going around it. So the whole thing. On the issue of the, the extrapolation on desktop exercises, um, yes, we do allow in Scotland verifiers um, to choose to depart from the basic guidance and to take variations if the verifier is competent to do that. and they can. But that is rarer than what was happening in England. And what we have said for the really complex fire engineering buildings, we would like to have a national hub. So the verifiers who are making those decisions are people who are at least as competent as the designers. One of the difficulties is if you get someone who is checking the, the design who is not actually even as knowledgeable as the designer. So we need to have in Scotland for the complex buildings, in my opinion, a hub of people who, who are of their equals in, in fire safety engineering. So that, that certainly gives me more reassurance to know that those that are signing these things off at a desktop level have that level of competence and experience and professionalism. Dame Judith? I would agree with that. I would agree with that. You have to have people who are who are involved in this in this process who are competent to make the decisions they're making. Uh, Dr. Stollard is right that it was the use and misuse of uh, desktop studies that there was something that was identified very early on in my review. And even in my interim report, I recommended that there were some severe restrictions placed on the way in which desktop studies were being used in England. Thank you. A very, it's not always patient, I should say to witnesses, but a very patient Graham Simpson. Graham, do you want to come in? Well, patient convener, because you were uh, covering the subject in uh, 
admirable detail. Um, uh, can I just ask about this test? I think it's the BS8414 test. Um, that there have been concerns uh, expressed um, it, by the UK government over that test, but Dr Stollard, you're, you've suggested retaining that? The English Building Control Authority is actually recommending in their consultation they wouldn't permit it, at least uh, as a defined one, but they still won't actually ban it. They're just saying they're not going to give it as much credence as it had. Uh, so that's for England. Sorry to be complex, but they have functional standards like we do. Yeah. What we have said is at this stage, and we're consulting on retaining it, frankly, they're not used very often, they're incredibly expensive, and anyone who's going to build a three-storey section of a building and then burn it down, because these tests are specific to a building, they're not sort of generality tests that you can then do 20 different buildings on it, uh, we've, we've kept it in as an option, simply on the advice of BRE, as I said, Dr Debbie Smith, because it is the best test available. And if we say we won't even permit that one, then we're, we're really closing down the doors and we don't have even a benchmark to go against it. So the moment we're consulting on keeping it, and I'll be interested to see what the responses to the consultation are. So why, why, would, they, why would they not want to keep it in, in England? I think you'd have to ask them that. <laughs> OK. Um, the, the, the Prime Minister um, in May... Uh, suggested that in, I in England they would uh, look to ban the use of combustible materials um, for cladding on high-rise buildings. We don't appear to be going down that route here. I might be wrong. Um, I With the exception of that one test, which may be possible, to, it depends on what she's using the term combustibility. I suspect she's meaning A1 and A2. And I said earlier, I'm a little uneasy about using the sort of the layman's term of combustibility because I'd rather stick with, it, with an A1, A2 test, and that is what the English Department of Housing, Local Government and Communities, I think, uh, are consulting on. So it, they're now consulting on the same as us, as A1 and A2. The only difference is, I think, the heights under which they're going to use it. Okay. So we'll end up here as safe as England, or England as safe as Scotland? I argue that we are safer than England. We will end up in a very similar place in terms of, of what cladding is allowed to be used. Yes, there was a consultation announced on the same day that my final report was published uh, to, to look at, uh, at cladding. Um, my interpretation of the current regulations in, and guidance in England already ban anything that would be classed as combustible. But again, I, I agree absolutely with Dr. Stollard that we've got to work, get away from these um, qualitative terms and actually refer back to real standards like A1 and A2, and I think we will end up in a very similar place. Yeah. I should point out it's no bad thing if we have a competition in making... Uh, our building standards and fire safety is as robust as possible. That's a good thing. I quite like that exchange in relation to how we're taking things forward. I think that that's a very useful thing. Uh, Andy Whiteman, do you want to come in to finish off with a line of questioning? Thanks so much. Yes, a few questions I had hanging over. I mean, I was intrigued, um, Judith, you were chair of the Health and Safety Executive, and you point out in your report that when HSE was introduced in the 1970s, that residential buildings were considered should be part of that regime, but, but we're not. Do you think that's got any relevance to the debate going forward? Do you think there is any case for <coughs> making buildings subject to the HSE? The, ju just to clarify, what happened in the 1970s was that when the Health and Safety at Work Act was, uh, was entered into force, uh, the section, section three of the Act that uh, gives the Health and Safety Executive jurisdiction over um, work affecting work that affects those who are affected by work as opposed to employers um, for clarity of roles and responsibilities uh, a letter was issued by a minister back then which said this t this takes a back seat behind building regulations as far as assuring the safety of buildings for the public are concerned so so that was what the letter did in in the 70s does it have a relevance? I think it does, because I think as a result of that 
the implementation of the construction design and management regulations in subsequent years have not gone as far in England as they have in some other parts of Europe. And, and that, that boundary between uh, building control in local authorities and um, health and safety, not just of employees, but of the public as well, uh, the, the regulator has been uh, has held back on some of that. The whole purpose of setting up this uh, joint competent authority now for uh, high-rise buildings in, in my report is to remove that barrier and to actually get them to work together so that they get the right answer for everyone and, and we don't have that delineation of responsibilities between one and another. It's always a problem with health and safety where you draw those barriers between yeah. One, one regulator's responsibility and someone else's. Uh, there are numerous examples of where that, barrier, that, that boundary exists. But this is one where I think the solution is fairly straightforward. We bring them together. OK, thanks very much. To work on. Um, Dr Stollard, in paragraph 36 of your report, you said on the need for, and this is in the context of high-rise buildings, on the need for additional stairways, there was no consensus among the review panels, but in the view of yourself, endorsed by all members of the international subgroup, um, you believe that there are there is a need to require at least two stairways in buildings of 18 metres. Can you just explain a little bit about why there was no consensus? What were the issues at play there? Were it, briefly, no, very very briefly. Yeah. We have a policy of stay put initially, and the key word there is initially. You should stay put initially, but you have the situation where if the stay put fails, then you've got to evacuate. Now that has stood us in, st in good stead for a very long time. And I'm not saying that policy is wrong. What I'm saying is that in building new for the future on high rise, we should ensure that, that if that stay put initially doesn't work and you have to evacuate, we have the choice of two staircases. That gives a level of redundancy. It permits firefighting on one staircase while fire evacuation is occurring on the other staircase. When I compared, when I discussed this with the, the checking group I had from Australia, the Netherlands, Austria and the US, they were all in agreement that we should be doing this. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that mm -hmm. but, we don't but have it. Why was there not a consensus among the review panel members? Because That's my question. it what hasn't was the failed in Scotland. OK. And therefore, they're taking the conservative view that it hasn't failed in Scotland. Therefore, we'll leave it as it is. I think having seen the failure at Grenfell mm -hmm. and, and the fact that the fire brigade had not trained for the bit after the stay put, the initial and when it stay put initially, and if it, that initial doesn't work, then you've got to evacuate. They hadn't traded, they hadn't prepared. I think we should, just out of common sense, be preparing for that. Okay, thanks for that. that Before, point, yeah, Minister, yeah, on you go. Point convener, consulting on uh, the two stair issue uh, thus far, the engagement shows that uh, folk are in favour of two stairs in principle. Just to, to give you a flavour of what's coming back. And just for one thing, we're only saying, saying it at a level above which high reach appliances from the fire brigade can't be used to lift people off. Um, Dame Judith, you talk about a more effective testing regime for construction products and labelling and product traceability. We've talked a little bit, a bit quite a bit about the testing regime. Um, what are kind of issues involved there? Because I mean, I, I recollect some of the conversation around Grenfell was in relation to the fact that a lot of this material is comes from all over the world. Um, there is a very complex supply chain. Sometimes something that is certified, as Dr. Stollert was saying earlier, um, looks the same as something else. I mean, how This seems quite ambitious. I mean, sure, this, this would be good, but when you're dealing with international supply chains um, and even stuff from out with the EU, and we're not going to be part of the EU, so how do you see that working? Is that really achievable, do you think? Yes, I think it is. Um, I, 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 what... What I was referring to was, was something we've already talked about, which is that one test at one point in time of a given set of materials is then used extensively by the industry to market that product for many years to come. It seems to me that in any other industry sector, we would not simply rely on a test that was done at one point in time. We would look to verify that those materials are still performing, as was, as was the case at the time of the test. Because, as you say, the more complex the supply chains, the, 
materials coming in from other parts of the world. It's not just substitution which takes place on site that we have to worry about. It's whether or not substitution that has not been declared has happened elsewhere in the supply chain. And the only way, ultimately, to do that is to, to instigate the system of, of periodic random testing of, of products. But that has to be coupled with traceability, because if you then discover a failure, you then have to be able to trace where that product has gone, just in the same way that you do in the auto industry if a failure is, is discovered, and they instigate a product recall to fix the problem. OK, that's, that's helpful. Something to that. Just, just to um, to add to that, um, one of the um, models of practice which is increasingly happening in procurement is the design by subcontractors, so that portions of a building are not designed at the initial stage when the building warrant is granted, but subsequently subcontractors take on and they design an element of the practice of the building. And it could be the, the cladding system, it could be the window system, it could be. Okay. The problem with that is that if at that point you don't have somebody who has designed the whole lot, i.e. The, the conductor of the orchestra, who knows how all of these pieces work yeah. together, that you can find pieces that don't work together and the problems are generally in the boundaries where two different elements of the building meet. And again, this is just a phenomenon which has developed where risk is pushed down the line, where people go out and seek tighter and tighter tenders from different subcontractors, allowing them quite often to substitute materials without proper approval and without an overall holistic view of how the integrated system works. And so you've got the elements themselves might all be fine, but it's how they go together and meet one another and, and impact on one another. And as I said, particularly the compartmentation issue is, is absolutely key in this. So there is a, an issue about how procurement can create extra risks by separating the elements down into individual design packages and you lose the total overall package. That used to be what the architect was responsible for in the, uh, in the, in the older model of, of procurement, for ensuring that all of those elements work together. And that would be part of the original design intent produced for by, in the warrant drawings. But that can often be lost by subcontractor design for little elements, and he ignores the elements next door to him. He does his own bit. OK, thank you. Thanks. Are there any more questions from committee members? Uh, before I thank you, and I will thank you, of course, if there's any additional bit of information you feel when you came here today you wanted just to get on the public record, um, please feel free to do it. Just now, is there any additional comments any witness would like, like to make? I'd just like to raise one small item, and I'll not make too much of it, but the system currently is that the person who signs a completion certificate in Scotland is not required to have any competence whatsoever can be anybody. And unfortunately, that means that the process of a completion certificate, which is supposed to confirm to building control that the building is fully compliant, can be signed by somebody who, who wouldn't know a nail from a screw. You know, and, and that's, that's, a, that's the, the current situation. I feel that we have to re-professionalise uh, that process to give you the checks and balances that you need. And that has been lost in the system to some degree. I think the system currently allowing somebody to sign um, who has no qualifications or knowledge that the building actually is compliant, probably hasn't been on the site, but signs that certificate and provides it to the building control, I think that system needs a wee bit of, 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 of looking at. Okay. Don't see any other indications for additional comments? No? So, um, can I thank everyone for coming along this morning? I, I, I've, said, I've said this um, on several occasions now. Our committee has never intended to second-guess the scrutiny that's been taking place by the Ministerial Working Group or... David Judith's review group down south, or Professor Cole, or Dr Stollard's work. It's a kind of, kind of proactive, constructive, additional layer of scrutiny just to keep a, a watching eye on it. I think this morning, again, has been a pretty useful discussion of the issues that underpin the challenges that face us all. So thank you uh, to everyone for coming along this morning. And we will now move to agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation. But I've got a note here saying we'll suspend briefly until we change the, the witness panel. Thank you, everyone.
Okay, we now move to agenda item three, which is subordinate legislation. And the committee will now take evidence on the draft affirmative statute instrument entitled the Registered Social Landlords Repayment Charges Scotland Regulations 2018. And can I welcome back a marathon session for you this morning, Minister. Welcome back Kevin Stewart, Minister for Local Government, Housing and Planning. Uh, and Simon Roberts, Policy Manager, Housing Standards and Quality, Scottish Government. Uh, this instrument is laid under the affirmative procedure, which means the Parliament must approve the instrument before the provisions can come into force. Following this evidence session, the Committee will be invited at the next agenda item uh, to consider a motion to approve the instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has reported on this instrument and did not draw it to the, to the Parliament's attention on any of its reporting grounds. Uh, can I invite, therefore, the Minister to make a short opening statement? Uh, convener, thank you for the opportunity to appear today to speak to the motion to approve uh, the Registered Social Landlords Repayment Charges Scotland Regulations 2018. Uh, when we introduced missing share powers uh, for local authorities in the Housing Scotland Act 2014, uh, we also introduced a power subject to consultation to extend those powers to registered social landlords. Uh, there are situations where a social landlord is the owner of some but not all of the flats in a tenement uh, and requires the cooperation of other owners to carry out essential work to repair and maintain the common parts of the tenement. Uh, we know that owners are not always able or willing to cooperate in common works and that this problem can lead to uh, deterioration in the condition of the building with a direct impact on the living conditions of the social landlords, tenants who live there. Uh, under the existing provisions of the Tenement Scotland Act 2004, uh, a social landlord has a right, as do other owners, uh, to participate in the majority decision-making process set out in the tenant management scheme. If the landlord owns a majority of the flats or can form a majority with some of the other owners, uh, work to repair or maintain common parts can go ahead. But if an owner can't or won't pay their share of the costs, the landlord is in the difficult position of using tenants' money uh, to pay for owners' shares if their const uh, const constitution or covenant allow them to do that. Uh, or, of course, uh, they can leave those repairs and maintenance undone. Uh, these regulations should help in some cases uh, by providing a more effective route to get owners to pay for their share of common works. Uh, these regulations allow a registered social landlord to enforce a majority decision by creating a repayment charge. A repayment charge is a form of security which is recorded in the land register against title deeds. The landlord can seek to recover the charge in instalments from the owner over a period of five to 30 years. And the security means that the owner will be obliged to pay their share of the cost before they can sell their home to another person. Uh, this is not a solution for every case convener. Uh, it won't help if the landlord cannot get a majority in favor of works or if the value of the owner's flat uh, is so low that their equity doesn't cover a, uh, a charge. Uh, but it will be a useful additional tool uh, for landlords looking to repair and maintain buildings in which they have a share. I'm happy to take any questions, uh, convener, uh, that any members may have. Okay, thank you, Minister. Are there any questions? Uh, Mr Whiteman? Yes, thank you, uh, Minister. I'm just wondering... Um, you know, what, why you've introduced this? Is this against the background of social landlords wanting it? And if that's the case, what is the scale of the um, the, the, the the problem um, that could be addressed by introducing this instrument? Um, I think it would be fair to say, uh, convener, that there are mixed opinions amongst reg re registered social landlords about um, this. Um, some say that they would make use of this power. Um, and others say that they would never make use of this power. Um, what this is intending to do is to give folks the flexibility, um, if they want to use it, 
um, to, to let them do so. Um, I said previously when we were discussing missing shares when it came to local authorities that I would extend this power to registered social landlords. That's what I'm doing. I'm not in the position of, uh, of uh, forcing folk to use a power, but I do want folks who do want to have this power to be able to use it. But there is actual practical evidence of where this would be useful. Um, I, I think we can see from what local authorities have done, um, you know, there are a number of local authorities who are making use of missing share power. Um, there are a number who are not, as uh, I pointed out previously. Um, so far, eight local authorities currently have a policy uh, in place for missing shares, and seven have used the powers at South Ayrshire, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeen, East Lothian and East Renfrewshire. Inverclyde has the policy uh, in place but hasn't used the missing share power. I want to give registered social landlords uh, in other places, maybe where missing share has not been used, the ability to use that power if they wish to do so. Okay, uh, Mr Simpson. Convener, uh, just a comment really, if that's okay. You can make a comment just now. The, the, there's agenda item four allows a debate on it, which would be another opportunity. But, but whenever why not, the, why whenever's the appropriate why not, why time, why not, why not just make it just now? Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I actually think this is a, a really Im uh, important um, reg regulation to bring in uh, because, as the minister says, um, it gives social landlords the the power. They they don't have to use it. Um, but at least they will have the power, and as uh, ev everyone in this room should know, there is an issue um, with uh, the maintenance of tenements. That's why uh, we have a, a tenement maintenance working group in this parliament, uh, which is working closely with, with the minister. Um, this, is, this is just part of the picture, um, but it's an important part. Um, I FOI'd uh, local authorities, I actually came up with 10 who've used the missing shares powers rather than seven but it's it's still a minority um, but at least they you know they have the power and I think it's important that registered social landlords do have it because it, it's vital um, that we bring some you know our, our buildings up up to scratch uh, rather than allow them to deteriorate so uh, I'm certainly in favor of this and if he says, do you agree, Minister, it becomes uh, a question. I, I welcome Mr Simpson's uh, comments. This is just another tool um, uh, in the box for, for folks to, to choose to use or not. I wish that more local authorities were using the missing share powers um, than currently are. We will continue to try and persuade folk. I think uh, uh, as some local authorities have used it, they've seen the advantage. Um, and quite often, um, convener, it's not even the use of the power. It is the threat of using the power that often can change attitudes. I've seen that happen. I'm sure others have. Um, this will be the same scenario, I'm sure, uh, giving RSLs this power. Um, it may move folk into some different uh, thinking um, as, as we move forward, and it may not necessarily be the use of the power, but the threat of the use that, that makes a difference. Um, as uh, Mr Simpson has said, uh, there is the cross-party working group at this moment. Um, I will work closely with that working group, as I've said previously in Parliament. Um, I think that we all recognise um, that there is work to be done when it comes to um, repairs and tenement buildings. Um, I don't think that this uh, is the panacea to everything, but I do think it's another tool in the box. Thank you, Minister. Are there any other questions? Okay. There have been no other questions. We will now move to Agenda Item 4, still subordinate legislation. And for this item, the Committee will formally consider Motion S5M12905, calling for the Committee to recommend approval of the draft Registered Social Landlords Repayment Charges Scotland Regulations 2018. Uh, only the Minister and Members may speak in this debate. And I invite the Minister to speak to and move Motion S5M12905. I'll just formally move, uh, Convener. Okay, thank you, Minister. Um, there's no requirements to, to, to have a debate on this, but the opportunity is here to raise any additional comments you wish to make at, at this point. Would any member like to participate in the debate? Okay, just correcting something in my notes there. Thank you. Um, 
Minister, would you like to sum up and respond to the, the, the wealth of points that were made in that, that dynamic debate there? Uh, no, thank you, Convener. OK. Uh, so the question is that motion 12905 in the name of the Minister be approved. Are we all agreed? We are. OK. Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr Roberts. The committee will report on the outcome of this instrument shortly. And we now move to agenda item five, which was previously agreed to take in private. So we'll now move into private session. Thank you.